Coming up today on the Joel Klatt Show, I've got game previews, including the massive game in the Northwest, Oregon at Washington. I've got USC at Notre Dame and the Group of Five game of the year coming up. College football has never been better. Interest has never been higher. I believe that we are at the dawn of the golden age of college football. It was an epic day of college football. It was one of those days where you fall in love with the sport all over again. What's going on, everybody? It is the Joel Class Show. I am Joel Clad. This show is presented by Hampton by Hilton, and we are very thankful that you're with us here on a Thursday as we preview the week of college football. And we've got a pretty good week of college football, folks. We got some great games that we've got to get to today um, and get through. I've got a few. I've got a. I'm going to have to go quickly because we've got a good slate of college football. Let me start with the game that I'll be at. So I'm going to be in Ann Arbor for Michigan and Indiana. And Michigan's favored by 33 and a half. Listen, Michigan's one of the best teams in the country. Indiana has struggled. So as much as of a preview as you're going to get here, Indiana is coming off a week in which they made an offensive coordinator change. They're going to be facing Michigan's number one scoring defense. Here's what I will say. It, it, this is not a, just a throwaway game because this is an Indiana team that played undefeated Louisville pretty close uh, earlier this year. In fact, they lost by seven. They got stopped on a fourth down at the one yard line with under five minutes to go. So they were right there and, and they've got a couple of really good players and we'll hope that they're they're healthy and ready to go. But the game is more about Michigan. If Michigan plays well, you would expect that they would win the game. The thing that I'm most interested in to see or or to experience with Michigan is first I want to see the chemistry and and more importantly feel the chemistry of this team because here's what's great about my job is when I get to go out to all of these different programs and I get to go into these facilities and I get to talk with coaches and talk with players I get a sense of what the chemistry is like are the is the coaching staff getting along with one another are the players getting along with one another like what what does it feel like in the building that's a big deal at least to me so this is going to be my first time at michigan this year and it's the first time that i'm going to get to feel that culture and that chemistry the last two years it's been outstanding it's been one of the 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 unsung the untalked about I think nuances with the success that Michigan has is the chemistry, what they had, what they built after the COVID year. And so now to walk in there, I'm excited to kind of see it and feel it in, in this version. And then the other part of this is the, on the field is the depth. When I walk around in warmups and when I see a team and cover a team and I do all their charts and I see the two deep and how dominant they can be, I get a good sense of how deep they're going to be. And this is one of the deepest teams, at least as I begin my study throughout the course of the week and I'm, and I'm getting prepared for this game. This is one of the deepest teams that I've prepared for in a long time. So I want to see that from my own eyes. And then the last thing is the size up front. This team is one of the best teams in the country at the line of scrimmage and they need to be, that's their style. That's their MO. And in particular on the defensive side, this defensive front, and, and, and more specifically, their defensive tackles look massive. They're all 300 pounds plus, and they do a great job of stopping the run. They do a great job of, of being disrupt, uh, disruptive, and as they call it, like destroying blocks, you know, getting through blocks and, and not allowing the opposition to sustain blocks. So as much as I could talk about J.J. McCarthy, as much as I could talk about the offense and, and Roman Wilson on the outside and Blake Corum as the running back and the deep uh, offensive line, those other areas are where I'm actually more interested to get around this team and actually see them uh, firsthand. By the way, the boa constrictor reference, it's something that we came up with right here on the Joel Klatt Show. I think it's still accurate for obvious reasons, and now other people are using it as well. So, Coach Fleck, thanks for uh, listening to the show. Let's move on. Oregon at Washington. What a game this is going to be in the Northwest. Like, this is going to be an unbelievable game and environment. I can't wait for it. I can't wait. They're both top 10 for the first time in this matchup's history. It goes all the way back turn of the century, not even this century, the last century, 1900, 115th meeting. These two offenses are 
as good as anybody's playing in college football, you know, and obviously with Washington, it, it relies heavily on throwing the ball and those guys on the outside, and they're going to get more healthy on the outside. So Michael Penix is going to get another one of his wide receivers back. Jalen McMillan will be back for Washington to pair up with Roma Dunze out wide. Uh, Millen is great. Polk is really good as well. These guys present so many problems for the opposition. They are great in one-on-one -on -one coverage. They can create space and win. And with Pinnock's ability to be a great passer and understand leverage and understand how to throw his wide receivers open, their passing game is one of, if not the best passing game in the country. So I can't wait to watch that. On the other side, Oregon is just like the efficient offense. This is, this is an offense that can run, they can pass, their quarterback can hurt you on the ground. They're incredibly difficult to stop in particular when they find their rhythm. Now, from a running game standpoint, they're averaging over 220 yards per game. And when you're looking at it per carry, they're actually the top team running the football in college football at over seven yards per carry. So they can get after it. This was one of the big questions for me coming into the season was Oregon and their offensive line replacing four guys up front. And they've done that. They've done a great job. This is, by the way, still the the remnants of having Mario Cristobal as a great recruiter and, and having the emphasis on the offensive line is that you still have those guys. Now, granted, they also went to the portal and they got better there. And Dan Lanning has done a, a terrific job of emphasizing defense, emphasizing toughness, emphasizing substance, as he likes to call it. And this is a really good team. So what does it come down to? All of this, hey, Joel, they're really good. Yeah, yeah we get it. They're top 10. What does it come down to? What it comes down to is always two things, always two things, maybe a third, quarterback play and turnovers. And, and generally speaking, it's harder to play well at quarterback on the road. And this environment is going to be nuts. This is a great fan base. Those of you in college football that don't know about Washington's fan base, they are a terrific fan base. They love the Huskies. In a lot of ways, Seattle is more of a Huskies town than they are a professional sports town in, in some ways. That stadium is going to be on fire, like in, in the best sense of the term. It's going to be a purple out. They're going to be getting after it, and that's a great environment, and that's going to be difficult to play well as a quarterback in that environment. Then you've got to hold on to the football, and again, the setting and the environment lends itself to more aggressive defense, the defense playing faster. When they play faster, they hit harder. When they hit harder, the ball comes loose. This is why home teams in a great environment tend to create more turnovers. It's just an unspoken kind of human instinct. You play a little faster and a little bit more aggressive when you've got the crowd on your side, and you certainly could expect that from Washington. So the key for Oregon has to be early success. They've got to do everything that they can do to get the crowd out of the game early. If I was Oregon and Dan Lanning, I would not defer if I won the, the toss. I would take the ball. I would put my offense on the field and hope that they can go four or five minutes and quiet the crowd and score a touchdown. That's the best way you do it. And then your defense can go out there and potentially get a three and out. Now, all of a sudden, you're in the middle of the first quarter. And guess what? Washington's only run three offensive plays. You've got to take a page out of Arizona's playbook. They limited the possessions for the Huskies in that game in which Washington played a, a one possession game down at Arizona. And if Oregon can do that and limit possessions, take the crowd out of it, slow it down a little bit, then they're going to have a great chance. Washington's favored by three. They should, they should be. If I had to make a pick, I've got to go with the home team because I think that environment's going to be incredible. So I think Washington's going to win. Doesn't mean I don't like Utah and I could very much, or excuse me, Oregon, and I very much could see them winning as well. That's just going to be a fantastic game. Hey, it's my favorite time of year. It is football season. And as you know, I take it seriously. So when I'm traveling on the road to watch my favorite teams, I cannot risk calling the wrong play with where I stay. Wherever I go, I know that I can count on Hampton by Hilton. I can depend on their comfortable rooms and their warm, friendly service. And their free hot breakfast, as you know, is an absolute game changer. So whether you're cheering on your team from the stands or never leaving the tailgate, Hampton by Hilton will always give you that win next up usc at notre dame now notre dame's favored in this game even coming off of a loss and this is the brady quinn matt leinert bowl we're gonna send big noon kickoff to notre dame stadium so 
If you're a Notre Dame student or fan, get out there and support my guys. They're not coming with us to Michigan, Indiana. They're going to be at this game, USC and Notre Dame. So get out there. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about the Bush push because obviously Matt's there, Brady's there, and that game was a classic back in 05. Now when you get to this game, though, this is concluding the, the brutal stretch for Notre Dame. Notre Dame just went Ohio State, Duke, Louisville, and now USC. Every one of those teams ranked. They lost the heartbreaker to Ohio State. Win the thriller against Duke, had nothing left against Louisville. They didn't play very well. Turned the ball over. They went in there. I don't think that they expected the environment that they got. That environment at Louisville was fantastic. And now they've got to come back and, and go back home. Good for them. To play USC and it's a departure from the rest of these teams like these were knocked down slug it out type of games physical games and now all of a sudden it's going to be USC comes in there with their high flying offense and Caleb Williams and so it's a departure of style and philosophy but then they get to come home I'm interested to see how much they have left what do they have left at the end of this stretch this is not like the NFL in the NFL Teams play at or near their best every single week, generally speaking. In college, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And for a lot of different reasons, but there are natural ebbs and flows in the season, and you're seeing that with Notre Dame as they're ebbing and flowing. Here's, here's the interesting part, is that this is now going to be the start of the really difficult portion for USC. So how much energy do they have to exert to potentially win this game? That's something to watch for because as they go down the stretch, five of their next six opponents are in the top 20. We've talked about all year about how difficult this Pac-12 is. USC is starting on that trek. So what does this game look like? How much energy do they have to expend if they're going to get a win? Probably a lot. How long at this point in the season, and this is what's happened now over the last three weeks, how long can Caleb Williams drag the Trojans along for the season? Caleb Williams is playing unbelievable football now to be fair he he wasn't great for the entirety of of the arizona game but he can elevate himself to a place where he takes that offense above the x's and o's i was shocked arizona kicked the extra point in the first overtime because you're just giving him more time the more time that number 13 has the more time that he's going to have to beat you because he's that good. He's got 28 total touchdowns so far this season. That's 11 more than he had at this point a year ago. The guy is playing sensational. Now, on the flip side, when Sam Hartman is on the field with Notre Dame and their offense is on the field with USC's defense, Notre Dame has to control the game on the ground, and they should be able to. USC's run defense has not been very good. They're allowing about five and a half yards per carry on non-sack plays. Their rushing defense numbers look better because they get to the quarterback. They've had, what is it, 22 sacks, which is third in the country. That comes off of the rushing yardage. So when you strip that away and you really look at what are they when the ball is handed off and they just have to defend the run, not very good. In fact, on non-sack plays, five and a half yards per carry, that's 106th in college football. If I'm Notre Dame, that's where I'm sitting. Estime is getting the ball. That run game, that offensive line is going to eat it up. They're going to eat up the clock. You got to keep Caleb Williams off of the field. You're not giving him an opportunity. You want Caleb Williams to touch the ball at maximum 60 to 65 times. That's the maximum plays that you want to see. They did that against Ohio State, came up one play short. Ohio State, I believe, had 65 plays in that game total. 15 of them were on the last drive. Ohio State had run 15 offensive plays up to that last drive before they went down the field and scored. So Notre Dame's got to put that same game plan into effect against USC. This is their best opportunity to keep Caleb Williams at bay. Williams might have his best attribute back on offense, his best threat, which is Zachariah Brantz. He was practicing this week. He missed the last two games with an undisclosed injury, but we don't know. We don't know what his status is going to be. This game is 100% about Notre Dame's run game. If they can control the game on the ground, then they'll win. If they can't, and Hartman has to drop back and throw the ball, then the pass rush gets involved. It's one of the best pass rush rushes in the country, 22 sacks. That's third in the country. 
then you are also giving your opposition more opportunities. So Caleb Williams is on the field. It's all about the Irish on the ground. If they can run the ball, then they're going to win. And by the way, they need this one. They need this one desperately because they've lost two of these three games, uh, their last three. The one that they won was almost miraculous. They got a fourth and 16. So if they were to lose at home to USC, in particular with the way that USC has looked over the last few weeks, people would not be happy with Marcus Freeman. And you know what? This is a game that they have to win. I think Notre Dame wins this game. There's rain and wind in the forecast that lends itself to Notre Dame, right? You want to slow things down, be methodical, run the ball. That's what they're going to have to do. Uh, okay, let's move on. Another good Pac-12 game. And this one is sneaky good for a lot of reasons. Let's get into it. UCLA and Oregon State. UCLA, way better than people realize. Oregon State, same better than people realize. In fact, DJU, DJ Uyunglele, he's coming off his best game in a game in which he had to play much better. He threw for five total touchdowns last week against Cal, but he had to because the defense gave up 40. They won 52 to 40 against Cal. Maybe a little bit alarming right there because I thought Oregon State's defense would be better than that. This is a team that lost to Washington State. UCLA is a team that really handled Washington State a week ago. The winner of this game is going to be in the best position to really push the teams that have separated themselves at the top of the conference. The winner of this game is a team that has a really good outside shot to get into that Pac-12 championship game. Now, it's going to be much more difficult for Oregon State because the slate in front of UCLA is actually quite manageable. So that's where I want to sit with this one because this game to me is really about UCLA. UCLA has to go on the road, which they already have this year in a hostile environment at Utah. So they won't be unfamiliar with what this feels like. They're not going to be shocked. I always felt as a quarterback, especially a young quarterback, that you would grow your most, develop your most from the first time you did something to the second, whether it's the first game to the second, the first time you're on the road in a big environment to the second. Well, guess what? Dante Moore is a young quarterback as a true freshman. He was in the pressure cooker at Utah. Didn't play that great. They only scored one touchdown offensively. He threw a pick six. They lose by seven. This is a guy that is learning and developing. He's made some big mistakes. They overcame them last week. He threw a pick six. They still beat Washington State. Why is that? Well, he doesn't have to be perfect. He doesn't have to be perfect because their defense is incredible. I mean, incredible. It's one of the best defenses in the country. They are for real. They lead the nation in yards per play. They lead the power five in takeaways. And most importantly, when you're playing Oregon State, this Beavers team, their rushing yards per carry allowed is fantastic. They lead the country. They're great in the red zone. They only allow 33% touchdowns in the red zone. That's sixth best in college football. They can lean on their defense, bring their quarterback along, run the football. If they win, watch out. That's a sleeper team like I mentioned uh, yesterday in the podcast. That is a sleeper team in the college football playoff race because of what's uh, uh, ahead of them down the stretch. That's going to be a really good game. I like UCLA in that game. Miami, North Carolina, another really good one. This one would have been a lot better if they would have just taken a knee. Obviously, a lot of talk about Miami. That's where I'll start. How do they react from the emotional loss last week? A loss in which it was 100%, not even 98%, not 99, not 99.9, 100% on their coaching staff, which goes right to Mario Cristobal. The coaches lost the game last week, period, period. I don't get, you can talk about the fumble, you can... You have an opportunity to take a knee that is 100% on the coaches. So how do they come back from that? I think is a fascinating thought, in particular against a team that is really good and playing really well and efficient. You're on the road if you're Miami and you got to face Drake May. And Drake May is as good as there is in college football. He's coming off a game against Syracuse where he's really feeling it. Had nearly 500 yards of total offense. He's getting Tez Walker back and more in shape. Tez had six catches last week. He's just going to keep getting better. 
The UNC offense has scored at least 31 points in every single game this season. They're another one of my sleeper teams in this playoff race. And this Miami defense is really good. So there's the matchup. It's a defense that stops the run. They're, uh, they're aggressive. They're athletic. That's the matchup. What is Drake May going to be able to do against this Miami defense? The overlooked part of last week's game, and, and even though I'm saying 100% on Cristobal, was the turnovers. Miami's turnovers hurt them badly. Um, they had, what was it? Four fumbles, I believe. Van Dyke threw three interceptions. That's not going to cut it. So they've got to hold on to the football. That game was at home. Now they've got to be on the road. I tell you, this Miami season had so much promise to it. You take a knee, you're undefeated. You go face North Carolina with a veteran quarterback and, and Tyler Van Dyke. Maybe you win that game. You're still undefeated. You're on your way to the ACC championship game, basically. You don't take a knee. You fumble. You let them go 75 yards in like three seconds. And now you've got to go to North Carolina. It could be back-to-back -back losses, and the season is like, what happened? And it's like that. It's a blink of an eye. Rain, by the way, is in the forecast for Saturday in Chapel Hill, so we'll see how those quarterbacks react to that. Um, a couple more games that i got to get to because these are very interesting games as it relates to the postseason. Iowa at Wisconsin. Haven't talked a lot about either of these teams, and it's not just going to be about Iowa's you know, a road to – whatever it is, 325. Is that what they need? 325 points on the season to get their hit their deal. They're behind that pace, by the way. Uh, their offense is not very good. This is the battle for the Heartland Trophy. It's going to be on Fox. The winner of this game, by the way, is going to be in great position to win the Big Ten West. In particular, if it's Wisconsin, if Wisconsin wins, every other team in that division will have two conference losses. Wisconsin would still be undefeated in Big Ten play. So this is a big game for Wisconsin. They're hosting Iowa. Iowa is down to their backup quarterback after McNamara tore his ACL. They've got their run game going with Braylon Allen. They've got now half a season under their new head coach and Luke Fickle. Again, you're at home. You're favored by 10 over a team that does not play quality offense. And even though Iowa plays quality defense, this is a game you've got to win if you're Wisconsin. If you're Luke Fickle, this is one of the first times that you can say like, all right, this is a program establishing and building win if you can win this. Because in large part, this is going to be the game that we'll look back on and say the West was won that day in Madison. I do love, I really do love Wisconsin and their ability to get better after that loss to Washington State. We haven't talked about them, but this is a team that continues to get better. I like Luke Fickle a lot. I like the fact that they're leaning into their run game. They're leaning into their defense. Their defense has only allowed more than 17 points one time. It was in the loss to Washington State. Iowa's offense is not going to threaten them that much. I like Wisconsin in that. By the way, they're favored by 10. Still like Wisconsin in that one. Last game, biggest game in the group of five season. This is it. Winner of this game likely gets the group of five nod into the New Year, uh, New Year's six bowl games. And watch out because Air Force is really good. These are the two highest ranked group of five teams, both just outside of the top 25. Wyoming's 27, Air Force is 28. I think Air Force should be a top 25 team. If we had a 12-team playoff format, by the way, one of these teams would likely be in the playoff, probably the 12th seed, probably having to go to the number five team in the country, which would be like Ohio State or Penn State. Uh, I would pretty much love that. I've always been a fan of both of these programs. Having grown up in Denver, had a chance to, to know a lot of guys that went to Wyoming and played there. A lot of guys that played for my father, who was a high school football coach, went to Wyoming. So I'm partial to that. By the way, I'm basically wearing a Wyoming sweater here. I got the, the brown sweater on. But I'm also incredibly partial to, to Air Force. Let me just tell you a quick story. My first game ever was at Folsom Field with my dad. But the most times I ever got to go to a college football game was always Air Force. And here's the reason. Air Force would give high school football coaches free tickets. We didn't have a lot of money. In fact, we were on a one teacher's salary, my dad's salary, and four kids. And you can understand what that was like. So he would get the free tickets to Air Force, and he loved to go down there. The reason he loved to go down to Colorado Springs and watch Air Force games was he loved to see the cadet cadets march in to Falcon Stadium because my dad is a former Marine. 
He was the first lieutenant in artillery d division during Vietnam, fought in that war. I'm very proud of my dad. And he loved to just be around the military culture and go down and see it and see the discipline and see them marching in, the Falcon flying over and the flyovers. So even though he wasn't in the Air Force, he loved the military culture of being down there at the academy. So I went to so many Air Force games, which means I'm a huge Air Force fan. Now, I, I would love it if either of these teams broke through and got that New Year's Six bid, being from that Rocky Mountain region. But boy, this Air Force team feels really good right now. They're one of the best rushing teams in the country, which you would expect. They're also a team that won 10 games a year ago. So this is not out of nowhere. This is a team that is very good. Wyoming, by the way, they're also a good team. They beat Fresno State. They beat Texas Tech. And they were tied with Texas 10-10 in the fourth quarter in Austin. So this is going to be an outstanding matchup. Air Force is averaging 330 rushing yards per game, by far the most in college football, about five and a half per carry. Uh, Wyoming's defense right in the middle of the pack as, as it relates to run defense. It's so difficult to beat the academy. They're so unique with the style of offense that they use. They're favored by 10 and a half. That's a lot. That is a lot, even though they're at home. I, I, I don't love the 10 and a half, but I think the Falcons win. I think Air Force goes on and wins and that they represent the group of five in the New Year's Six. And I just wish it was a 12-team playoff year so that we could have the Air Force Academy in the playoff. Can you imagine a scenario where we had a service academy in the 12-team playoff? I'm here for it. I'm rooting for it. And that's why, by the way, I would say if you win your conference, you should host. Because you know what I want to see? I don't necessarily care for Air Force at Penn State. I want to see like the eighth or ninth best team or the 10th best team have to go to Falcon Stadium. I want to see a team that squeaks in, doesn't win their conference, like let's say Alabama this year, have to go play Air Force at Air Force. That would be entertaining. That's what the college football fans would like and want. That's at least what I think. That'll do it for today's program. I want you to enjoy the week of college football because we've got some great games. Again, I'll be live in Ann Arbor with Gus and Jenny as we have Michigan and Indiana. Big noon kickoff. The show will be in South Bend as they get you all set for USC and Notre Dame. This show is presented by Hampton by Hilton. Can't thank you enough for partaking wherever you partake. Follow us on social media at Joel Clatt Show. Subscribe, like the show, leave us a review, and we'll see you next Monday.